I work at Oros University, for who doesn't know me, and uh, if I can define myself in any ways as a food scientist, I would say that I am ad an addicted to physical techniques. So I have a problem. I like to actually measure things at different uh, length scales. And uh, I do, uh, I think Nicholas said it really nicely yesterday. Uh, we like to identify a problem and not necessarily um, focus on a particular technique, but we try to find what will help us in, uh, uh, in understanding the problem and uh, figuring out what are the mechanisms around uh, that particular effect. So my expertise is in ingredients interactions and structuring of foods, both in terms of structuring during process, during digestion, any type of structure really intrigues me. And uh, my, of course, my expertise is in proteins and colloids. So, uh, so this is the focus of what I will uh, say today. And I will try to add a few things from what my colleagues said yesterday, but as I said, more from a user perspective than an expert in the techniques that are highlighted during this conference. So uh, first of all, why am I involved with uh, the Northern Lights and Food? Because uh, as I said, I'm intrigued with powerful techniques. And I do believe that uh, the techniques that we can access to uh, or we will be able to access to when everything is up and running are of uh, very good use to food. How? I'm not sure. And I think that I probably um, share this vision with many of my colleagues, both in industry as well as in academia. And, uh, and I think it's important for us to really understand. And uh, I always laugh. I put this little table here with the, the name of the actual uh, facilities. And this is already the first barrier. What the heck is that? You know, I don't understand why people have to put nicknames to these <laughs> to these places. So that you know, it's yet one more barrier to me understanding what what they are. So you know, it's just it's just a completely new world for us. And uh, but it's extremely attractive to uh, to be able to to use something that is so powerful and, uh, and will allow us to really understand the structuring and the dynamics at a uh, detail that we could not get with any other method. So that's why I'm involved in this group and, uh, and I try to hang on as much as I can because at the end, I know that this is going to help me uh, understand my systems and also to contribute to uh, the, the challenges that we have within the new sustainability um, uh, challenges that we have. Uh, it is a really good time to be a food scientist and a food researcher. And we've heard that in the panel yesterday too, because we are, have all these uh, new problems related to new food systems that, you know, of course, before we always did really good food, food science work, but now we actually have a meaning and a meaning that is more than just uh, improving or, or excelling in some processes or, or just improving our yields. It's really about changing the food system and becoming carbon neutral. So, you know, less is more. We have to avoid waste. We have to understand better our byproducts. We have to uh, learn how to use new sustainable sources. We need to design new diets, which includes the use of proteins uh, different blends of proteins into a system, and we are not used to that. We like to use commodities, so we are either dairy scientists or meat scientists, or you know, or, or food chemists. But we do not really uh, understand how proteins interact with one another. Uh, we do not want to overprocess, and so better safe than sorry doesn't does no longer apply to us. And we want to create clean labels and that's not very easy with some of the functionalities that we actually want in a food. So what do I work with? I work with processes and I think that I have myself in my research program, a pretty big challenge. We try all to have some huge um, 
impact in to become carbon neutral we want to have uh, changes to current processes and try to use less energy less water less waste less cleaning chemicals and i don't know if you heard yesterday uh, peter weise at one point he said the consumer will not see the change because the consumer, we are not used to seeing incremental changes. And if I have to say, actually, I think that the consumer will have to see changes because we cannot reach carbon neutrality only with incremental changes. We actually will have to have disruptive changes to our food system. And, uh, and so, although this is super scary, especially for the food industry, because it will mean new, um, uh, new equipment, new CapEx investments, uh, and of course, you cannot make CapEx investments that, that require two or three years and a lot of money if you don't really know what's going on in in the detail that you really need. And this is why I think it's important for us to give them all the information on structuring that they can possibly have. So uh, one more point around this is that, of course, when we are talking about disruptive change, we're also talking about new sustainable ingredients that uh, currently we're simply processing the same way as we're used to because you know, that's how the equipment is in the plant. So we are going to basically make a, uh, a, a soy milk, a almond milk using the same kind of equipment that we use, that we are used to and that we know very well. Um, and perhaps that's not the right way to do it. And, uh, and also we have to be able to target these processes to the, to the properties of the proteins, which are obviously very different than the properties of the proteins that we know of. So with, without further ado, I, I will tell you uh, that as a, as, as a person, as a researcher that works in a, in a very well-equipped department where we can do any type of analysis from the molecular to the microstructural to the supramolecular as well as looking at processes and uh, and uh, uh, looking at mechanisms during processing uh, it requires me a huge um, activation energy to try to figure out when do I need to come to Lund because truly, truly, is it worth it? Is it worth it to, uh, when is it important for me to really understand the details of this? And I think that probably I share this with many of my colleagues in industry that say, well, okay, but if I can understand the system with other techniques, why should I use um, the uh, large scale facilities. So, uh, you know, this is, this is really where I come from when, uh, when, when I was thinking of giving this talk. And hopefully I'm being a little bit provocative here. And as you can see, like I am part of this team. So I, I don't really truly believe that the, the activation energy has to be that high, but of course it's, it, it is, an issue that we have to resolve. And I believe that to resolve this issue, we need education. We need to really understand these techniques and allow people like me to feel comfortable enough that what we uh, can achieve is, is actually uh, useful. Okay, so uh, I am not going to uh, talk more about structuring. I think we've heard it for two days now. What I want to say is that today my talk is more related to protein systems, as we have already heard from Francisco about carbohydrates, and we've heard quite a bit about emulsions and the fats from Alejandro. So I tried to focus it a little bit more on protein and especially new proteins. So uh, without further ado, 2050 dietary shift, at least 50% of our diet will have to be plant-based. And, uh, and with that, what, what that really means is that, of course, the animal proteins will still be part of our diet, but they will have to be value added and therefore 
very high, uh, very high nutritional value and, uh, and part of the sustainable diet. We have to therefore improve both our current systems as well as develop new systems. And when we look at proteins pivotal to our diet, we cannot only talk about the essential amino acids and how you know, these little legal blocks actually uh, fit in our body and then we break them down and we absorb them and yes, faster or slower. But I think what is very important here is that peptides and how we break down the peptides and how the protein structure our food are the critical points of developing new diets. And let's not make the mistake of, of just making food that is that is tasting good for the consumer today without actually planning for the best outcome from the nutritional standpoint. Because if we don't do that and we just try to just please the consumer as they are used today to their food, we probably will make a mistake and we will not provide them with the appropriate diet and we will not resolve the rest of the picture, which is obesity and, uh, and malnutrition or undernutrition. So how do we use new proteins and how do we use them within the current system that we have? And, uh, and how can we create novel forms of foods? And let's just try to be a little bit innovative and not only think of fitting what we, uh, the, the new proteins to what we have today. And uh, within this, uh, this protein debate of the new proteins, I think we also have to remember that there is a lot of discussion on the protein biorefinery and that perhaps using purified ingredients or isolated systems all the time is not the right way to go. And that because as we move uh, along the pyramid of, of the isolation, we also create very high resource intensive processes. We have to purify, we create a lot of byproduct. So when is it appropriate to use isolates? And when is appropriate to use less refined ingredients is also part of the discussion when we are reformulating or redesigning the foods. But this creates a huge set of problems because if we, of course, if we are using an isolate, we're spoiled. Okay, because we know exactly how it will behave and we can mix it and match it with other Lego bricks in our formulations so that we can derive the final ingredient, the final uh, food, and we can control the process to the T. But unfortunately, if we're using less refined ingredients, that will not be so useful. And this is quite challenging, for example, and this is something that uh, Anna and I want to work on because in the non-refined ingredients, what do you normally have? You have proteins, you have fiber. And you have to really understand how the fiber can be perhaps modified, maybe within, with, uh, uh, with, the, with the aid of enzymes or fermentations so that we can create um, a, a functional fibers as we move along into the process of, uh, of production of the ingredients. So a lot of in situ processing, in situ modifications of very and very targeted. And I think we are just at the beginning of this journey because if you think about it, yeah, we are, do, we are using some enzymes, we're using enzymes, uh, commercially available enzymes that are uh, full of different things in there, very low impurity, how can we really target a change in pectin modification? Or how can we make a, a different, uh, you know, blockchain distribution of, uh, of methylated esters in a pectin if we are using commercially available enzymes and we don't really understand what we are doing? So it's it's an art versus a science, but I think, you know, we have to move it towards science. And I think that uh, knowing exactly the changes that happen during, during these processes at, a, at the molecular and supramolecular scale will be very important. Um, and, uh, and, and this is why uh, I think that the toolbox that we are growing now uh, as a team in Northern Lights of Food will provide us with this kind of information. 
uh, both in spectroscopy as well as in imaging. Uh, and it will be allowing us to really fine tune uh, ingredients changes. Um, so let me give you a couple of examples of, 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 you know, of my puzzled mind when I actually read some of the papers that I see that are related to uh, the work that is done in large scale facilities. Uh, we know the structure of soy proteins. We, I think we have worked on soy protein probably longer than any other plant protein because it used to be a byproduct of, uh, of the oil industry and actually quite well funded. And when there's funding, there is research. So we know quite a bit about soy proteins. And in the 80s, uh, already we have had an enormous amount of scattering work done on, on uh, plant globulins. So, you know, this is just an example of a paper from 1985 where there was a scattering, uh, the scattering of 7S and 11S proteins from P. So, and of course, uh, all the time, these, uh, these, type of, uh, uh, these type of curves were developed uh, to understand the structure of these proteins and uh, with complementary techniques, uh, such as proteomics, uh, STS page electrophoresis, even mass spectroscopy, uh, light scattering, spectral analysis, micro DSC to see if the proteins were still um, uh, native. So with that in mind, basically, they all kind of, uh, kind of sort of uh, do the same thing. They are globular. Uh, they are about four, five nanometers in size, and of course, difference in molecular weight, depending on, on, their, uh, on their subunit composition. But now, here is my puzzled mind. Uh, when I look at soy milk, Soy milk looks, the par soy milk particles look like this. And they are much larger, they contain fat, and, uh, and this is really what I process. Is the information, of course, it's nice to know uh, how is the protein, the subunit looking like, but is that telling me anything about how this uh, particular material will behave? And uh, they are colloidal particles. They increase in viscosity as a function of concentration. And, uh, you know, uh, they, have, they haven't been studied uh, in much more detail than this. So that's, that's where I think there is a little bit of a gap here that I think we need to fill. The other puzzling thing about looking at plant proteins um, in a fundamental sense is that when, when we, it, this is a, um, this is a, a micro DSC of, uh, of soy proteins uh, prepared either in the lab or in the pilot plant. And you can see that while in the lab, you can see both the 7S and 11S denaturation peak when, when you prepare it in the lab, you do not see these peaks anymore. So obviously you have already had aggregation or maybe you just cannot dissolve these systems anymore. Um, solubility curves as a function of, uh, of which sample do we have? This is a native soy protein isolate. This is made in the pilot plant and this is denatured in the plant. And as you can see, if I have to heat the powder to actually dissolve it. So uh, how do I deal with this? Because all the work that we do in the lab actually looks at non-denatured systems. And uh, uh, here are some uh, uh, electron microscope pictures of uh, proteins at interface, of soy protein at interface. And of course, when it's native, you have a very nice thin layer at the interface, but then you have all these aggregates as well. And, uh, and many times now when, uh, when we do these studies in the lab, um, my students say, well, should I centrifuge the sample before I homogenize or, or should I not? And of course, if you, if you centrifuge the sample, you will get only part of the, uh, the protein population. 
again, I'm just being provocative here, okay? It's not that um, I'm saying, well, how do we, uh, I don't have a solution to this. A uh, very recent paper uh, on, uh, on the studies of heat treatment of soy proteins using, uh, using X-ray scattering. And uh, as you can see here, they, uh, they basically looked at uh, an acidic and a, a basic treatment, uh, alkali and acid and different heating treatments and looking at unfolding of the protein. And it's very nicely seen the unfolding of the protein, the, um, the temperatures of treatment and the pHs are extremely high and low. And the times of heating where you're actually seeing a change in the structure are five hours. Who's treating proteins in, the, in food for five hours? That would be a very expensive um, way of doing it. Uh, Another example here uh, of another very recent work on rice glutamine. Rice glutamines are very difficult to solubilize. So, uh, okay, we have obviously looked at some soluble fraction of it. And, uh, and the SACS uh, profiles very clearly show a, um, a loosening of the structure with, uh, with eating treatment. But look at the type of heat you have to apply to these proteins before you're actually seeing a structural change. You have to uh, treat them at 100 degrees for 60 minutes. Um, so uh, this, these are just very interesting studies, of course, but how do I apply them to my processes now? One last one on, uh, on plant proteins that I thought of was quite interesting. Again, this is quite new too. They, uh, they actually went one step forward and they managed to demonstrate that uh, oat protein is uh, an ellipsoidal shape. So it's very cool to be able to see that with these techniques, not only the size uh, or trying to model the size, but you can also model their shape. And that's very useful if um, if perhaps we can do something that is a little bit more relevant. So how can we contribute to this field of, of knowledge and as food scientists? I think that's, uh, uh, that's quite important. So here is a picture. It was one of my favorite pictures from one of the PhD students at Wageningen. Uh, I always love when scientists are also artists. Is I, I just cannot do that. So what uh, what is really nice from this picture is that it's it's showing how challenging is the molecular architecture when you're looking at extraction of plant proteins from different materials and how proteins will be interacting with, uh, with the other components in the system. And man, I am a dairy chemist by training. I am spoiled because in dairy, although we say it's a complex system, at least we can separate things physically. They are different sizes and they're quite separated from one another. Um, here, I think that the easiest system that you can look at is legumes that have starch granules that are separated from the protein bodies. And you can actually do some dry fractionations with this. But when you're going to plant cells like, uh, like um, microalgaes or or green green proteins from plant, from uh, from leaves, for example, you have interactions with chloroplasts and uh, with polyphenols, and uh, I mean the protein quality is very difficult to maintain. And uh, and here is uh, is the solubility of uh, three commercial pea protein ingredients as a function of pH. We just uh, did this study because we wanted to pick which protein to use for our for our tests. And as you can see here, the two isolates have a very low solubility in, uh, in, in, a, in a buffer system. Okay, you have to beat the heck out of them before they start solubilizing. And this is because they are being spray dried and, and dried. The, uh, the green line is the dry separation technique. So what I was saying here that you can take 
uh, a legume and, and do just a dry fractionation. So you never actually extract, heat, um, filter, dry, evaporate. Uh, this is just a dry separation technique. And of course, the, um, the protein status in that system is much less denatured and it can be solubilized. But let's not forget though, because a lot of times people talk about uh, you know, low processing or, or minimal processing, but we also have to think about food safety. And, and, you know, it's very interesting how sometimes we kind of forget that most of our food needs to be somehow heated at some point of the process. So, you know, when do you heat it is now it's, I, I guess, the question, not, not how do you eat it or sorry, how do you eat it and when do you heat it, but not necessarily if you heat it, because you do have to somewhat, somewhat have a safe product. Uh, okay, so I think Ramune later will talk a little bit more about the cellular architecture. So I, I will not, I will not uh, steal her thunder. Um, but uh, here is a, an interesting paper that I found that I thought it would be interesting to um, uh, to share with you because it was uh, carried out using synchrotron FTIR imaging. And, and I think this could be a quite an interesting technique for us uh, because it allows us to see differences in, in this case, differences in the roasting of the seed. And I, I'm not really like, of course, I didn't go too much in detail on, on exactly what they found, but I thought it was quite interesting that you could see the denaturation of the protein already as, uh, as the, the seed was roasted. Oh, sorry, I went all the way to my end. So let me just now, I, uh, okay. So what can we contribute? I think we need to study aggregation. We need to study behaviors of these systems. And, uh, and we need to do this in, uh, in conditions where, um, where we have thermal mechanical treatments. And wh what do I mean by that? Shear, concentration effects, uh, moisture levels, um, all these, and of course, temperature and environmental conditions. Because if we do not do this, we cannot understand how these systems will behave in, uh, in realistic conditions. And I, uh, maybe I have to debate this uh, a little bit with my Unilever colleague of, that said, well, you know, I want to have these systems on the line. And I agree, it's nice, but I think that if we understand the mechanisms at a very, uh, in, in detail, then we can perhaps relate this mechanism to some more simple online measurements that we can do. Um, so that's really what we have to try to do because right now we do not have the, uh, the, the right machinery to understand this uh, in, uh, in the plant. And, uh, and it is important to spend different length scales of these processes because we do not know which critical length scale is linked to which property. And, that's, and I think that's, uh, that's critical. Uh, one very cool study of my good friend from New Zealand, um, Martin Williams, Bill Williams, uh, I thought this was a good uh, example of how we could use neutron and X-ray and, uh, and the famous contrast matching uh, that everybody talks about to really start to understand interactions between ingredients. And he's done it very cleverly, looking at a, a complexes between beta lactoglobulin and pectins. And uh, by basically matching, he was able to model better what, uh, what is happening when you're adding a certain amount of pectin to the system and a certain type of pectin. Which goes back to my initial thoughts on less refined ingredients and how we do need to understand how uh, fibers and all sorts of soluble fibers and carbohydrates interact with uh, less refined proteins. 
uh, one other example from this complex world and how people are adventuring into something that is a little bit more complicated than a one single system is the work that is again done in Australia um, on uh, droplet stabilized, uh, sorry, on uh, microgel stabilized emulsions, where they basically prepare, prepare the microgel particles. In this case, was beta lactoglobulin particles or whey proteins particles. I don't remember, but uh, they really managed to see the uh, thickness of the interface. When we do this with uh, pure cis pure plant protein systems, we have uh, and we use ell ellipsometry in the lab. We have uh, um, thicknesses of about two, three nanometers, and uh, and it's uh, you know it's it's very strange because I think that if we actually used um, the entire system, then we would have Pickering stabilized emulsions and much larger scale. So we need to know the chemistry, and then we can study the dynamics. And we need to get detailed structure information. I hope that this gives you uh, a, a, an idea um, of it. And uh, and of course, we uh, we can look at all sorts of less refined systems. Uh, I, I don't want to go too much in detail on the microstructures here of what we see. But basically, I just wanted to give you an example of what happens if you have a rapeseed and you try to make rapeseed milk, whatever that, you know, like an extract directly from, from the uh, rapeseed. Depending on where you're starting, you can start at pH 7, or you can start at pH 5, you can start at pH 8 and do an extraction. And then you can also um, fluctuate the pH. So you can start at 8 and then go down to 5 uh, because the solubility will change. But as you can see here, also the, the complexes of proteins with the oleosomes and how much oleosomes you're carrying with the protein will change by doing this, uh, these pH extractions. And everybody's doing these pH extractions now, but they just look at amount of soluble material, amount of protein left, yields, and, uh, and we do not know much about the supramolecular structure of these complexes. Uh, we need, we need uh, um, relevant environments. And uh, here are just a couple of examples of, uh, of ingenuity in the creation of relevant environments. Um, Elliot Gilbert likes to work with starches, and uh, he has created a little RVA system to look at how uh, starch gets gelatinized during uh, in situ. And it's, it's quite clever. And honestly, I think it's quite low budget too. So it is possible to come up with some of these systems and really see uh, the systems in scale. But what would happen if you actually have complexity in this, then you start having problems with modeling, with really understanding what these curves actually will tell you. This is a, this is a case, a, a very recent study that showed that, that if you add more and more P protein to a, a dough matrix, the dough changes. And and quite a bit. So the red, the red spots here are P proteins into this dough matrix. You can see the, 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 the microstructure is completely different. So what is the effect of these novel proteins that we're adding to the starch, into the starch gelation? And these are important problems. And of course, we cannot do this, we cannot study these systems in solution. So mm, uh, I don't know, I don't have the answer to that, but maybe this clever group can think of nice ways to do this. And, uh, and again, protein, mixed proteins. Uh, this is a whey gel with fat globules. And this is the same formula, just changing the protein matrix. Lupin only, P protein only, oat protein only, and mixed with whey. This is reality. So how do we, I, I want to know what's going on in the systems. And I think that, uh, you know, we have a long way to go. 
another clever uh, in situ system that I think would be quite interesting to uh, to use. We saw a lot of uh, a, a lot of talks about fouling and membranes. Um, I don't want to only know after fact. I want to know what's happening while I filter. So how do we do this? We can do this, but of course it will take it will take a, quite a few brains uh, getting together because by by ourselves we cannot do this. Uh, how do we hydrate powders? We have studies on neutron that show that you know maybe we have some differences when we hydrate a powder or you know in sands when you because of course you don't have the water signal. Um, but how do we dehydrate powders? And we, we heard people talking about spray drying yesterday. And I would say, how do we hydrate powders, but we actually don't go to solutions? You know, there's a lot of processes where we hydrate powders, but we never get to a soluble phase. So what happens to the proteins when you are in conditions where you have only, you know, maybe 0.5 of water activity at the end or 0.4 or 0.3 of water activity? I'm not really sure we actually understand this. Entropy of systems and, 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 uh, and fiber formation in, uh, in proteins. Um, I am particularly interested in mozzarella, of course, but or in cheese substitutes. But of course, there's all the area on uh, on meat replacers as well. And I think this, uh, this paper here um, that Wim probably will talk about, so I won't, uh, I won't say much about it, uh, to me is a good stepping stone in the right direction, because it was able to uh, already give us uh, an idea of how we can get uh, sub-micron information on fibers uh, and, uh, and, and how to connect them to tensile tests. And my last uh, thought is that when we look at systems like that, of course, we cannot only look at sub-micron, we also want to look at what happens during modifications or, or, or textural strains to the system. And I think that we could learn a lot from what's happening in Stephen Hall's lab on tomography, because they have done this on packaging for a long time. So of course, it's not really contrasting the same way, but maybe we can become clever about it. So with that, um, I'm finishing my talk. And I, I just want to say, hey, let's learn from each other. We cannot do this alone. None of us can. And, um, and we need to have a very good understanding of the system. Uh, and we need to build suitable environments. Because for food scientists, if we do not have suitable environments, uh, we can only do so much. And with that, I thank you for, um, for giving me the time to speak. And, uh, and I pass uh, back the, the airwaves to Anna. Thank you, Melina. Thank you for excellent talk.